All righty then. Is the lighting okay? Oh yeah, it's okay. Let me see. Yeah, the lighting's good. Okay then. <laughs> guys hear me yeah hey guys sorry about that that was the other computer Shh, boy it's okay I'm always gonna get distracted so the lighting should be good okay just waiting for a few more faces to show up Lopez Media Ministries International Lord Jesus bless every one of you just pray as we're waiting for more people to show up pray Holy Spirit fill me the Holy Spirit fill every one of us the blood of Jesus Christ wash me the blood of Jesus Christ wash every one of us the Holy Spirit anoint me to speak truth without error. <clears throat> I hope the Holy Spirit just fills my lungs, my chest, my throat with, with life from his presence. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May the Father loosen my tongue and anoint my mouth by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak the words that the Holy Spirit would have me speak for the glory of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We praise you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We praise the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way with me and everyone present. <clears throat> Please anoint us, anoint me. <clears throat> Loosen my, my tongue to speak your words and just fill my lungs and chest with life from your glorious presence and make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your servant. Servants, Holy Spirit, protect me from stammering and confusion and from error for the glory of Jesus and constrain me from being unnecessarily offensive. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh and cover us with the blood of Jesus and seal us by your power and might to be perfectly united with one another as we are united to the Lord Jesus and Jesus increase and we decrease and wash in the holy blood of Jesus and wash our loved ones in the blood of Jesus. In my case, my daughters. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Please have your way. Please. And give us the power to live for Jesus, to be in love with Jesus, to serve Jesus, and not to be lip service. Please. We need you, Father, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. I actually got criticized by a Reformed Christian whom I don't like too much. <clears throat> he swoons over James White, making fun of me for praying these prayers because... His assertion was it's like my prayers assumed that it's like magical formula, right? But that just shows you what kind of ignoramus he is. May God have mercy on him in Jesus' name. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Spirit. Pray for the internet connection and for the quality of the camera to be clear in Jesus' name. Yeah, you'll always get critics. You're never going to satisfy everyone shanna shanna afwini so one thing i don't want to be is a crowd pleaser and one thing i don't want to be is unnecessarily offensive so we trust the holy spirit to give us the power to speak truth and love to be bold when we need to be and to be gracious and humble when we need to be and glorify jesus christ because i'm going to offend a lot of people today <clears throat> already i got some criticisms because of my exegesis of john 6 53 right and I just want to say something. People are going to be watching this later on. Here's one thing you don't do. If you want me to hear your case, if you want me to consider your position, don't proselytize me. Don't come and tell me I'm wrong. Don't come and tell me I need to listen to so-and-so because that's a sure way of getting me to ignore you. I don't like to proselytize people. I don't like to shove my faith down people's throats, and I don't like when it's done to me. I'll preach the gospel, I'll share the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone who wants to listen, but if someone doesn't, I leave him or her be. I don't like to proselytize people, so I don't like it to be done to me. So 
if you want me to consider your position, don't come up to me and say, I disagree with you, disagree with you, you're wrong, and Sam, you need to listen to this guy. No, right? Because that's a sure way of getting me to <clears throat> tune you out, right? And I pray that God will keep me humble and teachable and destroy my pride and arrogance, because I have pride and arrogance, and just fill me with the Spirit, to trust the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth. Did the Holy Spirit raise Jesus from the tomb? Yes, Richard Ems, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ raised himself. The Father raised Jesus. All three persons of the Godhead worked together perfectly to resurrect Jesus' physical body and to make it immortal and indestructible. All right. I pray the picture is good. Is the picture good? On my end, the camera doesn't look too good. Is it good? Now, Richard Ems, let me give you the references. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, as the Lord Jesus enables me to recall passages. Holy Spirit, I trust in you. Enable me to recall passages and exegete them perfectly for the glory of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Those are the two passages that speak of the Holy Spirit's role. In raising our Lord Jesus immortal, right? Other passages ascribe that to the Father, and other passages ascribe that to the Son. Only pray to Jesus. So forget the Father and the Holy Spirit. Paradox, don't start your nonsense. I'm not in the mood to tolerate nonsense. I'm going to block people. As you can see, I'm, I block a lot of people because, number one, I do want to reach thousands for the glory of Jesus, but thousands of people who are teachable and want to learn. And if you're not one of them, I'm not politically correct and I'm not nice. So let's not start this nonsense. Only pray to Jesus. So forget the Father and the Holy Spirit. Shame on you for saying that. All right? Anyway, we're just waiting for a few more faces to show up. All right? And thank our brother Orbiter, who is going to be posting verses to help me to help you for the glory of Jesus Christ. I don't know. I don't know what, 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 what the, does it matter what I think of them. Right? What does it matter what I think of them? If they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're preaching the truth and they're preaching the true God, may God empower them more and more. At least they're doing it, not like us sitting behind our computer screens, right? right? All right. There's a lot of issues I want to discuss. I want to start a series on refuting this one cult leader, Gregory Stafford, who started a cult group called Christian Witnesses of Jah. I called him out to debate, but he's a coward like the rest and won't debate me and makes excuses. He is a cult leader, and if you watch his videos, he's very demonized. I used to have a lot of love and respect for him, but now that I'm seeing him, man, you can tell by his countenance, wickedly demonic, even his laughter. I pray Jesus gives me the opportunity to debate him and decimate his arguments and expose him for the heretic and cult leader that, that he is. So Lord willing, I want to do a series on refuting the assertion that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. He did this seven-part series, some of the most pathetic arguments, trying to identify Jesus Christ as the Archangel Michael. I have no respect for him anymore. He's one of those guys I have no respect. And I pray he watches this because I'm calling him out. Put me in my place if you're confident. He used to be a Jehovah Witness. He started his own cult following. He's a modern cult leader and a demonized one, really influenced by Satan. His name is Greg Stafford, Christian Witnesses of Jah. All right? So I want to do a series on refuting the assertion that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Another brother named Pablo brought up what is now catching on among many Christians. It's a form of dispensationalism that teaches up until Paul, the conversion of Paul, the Jewish followers of Jesus taught repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. But then when... <clears throat> the Jews rejected Jesus, and some would place that rejection at the time of Stephen's martyrdom, and God turned his attention to the Gentiles. Then he preached salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus. Pablo, am I getting it correct? Yes, and please do me a favor. Smash that like button and try to bring in more people to come so we can rival David Wood. He gets over a 1,000. He ain't better than me. No, I love that brother. Right? Not too much, but I still love him. Okay, all righty, 1611, the only way to heaven. The king ain't on, the king ain't in it. 
All right, we're going to begin in a few minutes. Shemuni, can you explain how it is Jesus intercession right now? I don't know what he means. Can I explain? It? Uh, what's there explained? He's there at the right hand of the Father in his glorified physical body. And because the Father and Son, Holy Spirit, have perfect communion and fellowship and intimacy with one another, <clears throat> that communion entails <clears throat> going before the Father on our behalf. How does that work? I don't know. I don't know how it works because remember, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are omniscient. So they already know what the other is going to say before he says it. So I don't know how it works. It's an eternal reality beyond my pay grade, beyond my ability to fully comprehend. But I do know he intercedes before the Father. He speaks to the Father. The Father speaks to him. He's in love with the Father. The Father is in love with him. They have intimate, perfect, loving communion, and they do so with the Holy Spirit as well. Right? I don't know what you mean by pray. How do you define prayer? See, this is where it's going to get tricky. You're going to use a term and define it one way, and I'm going to use the same term and define it differently. What do you mean by pray? Explain to me prayer. This is going to tie in with the communion of saints. Explain to me prayer, and I pray the Holy Spirit fills us with love and joy and peace and power for the glory of Jesus. Right? Okay, speaking to God. So if Jesus is not speaking to the Father, then who, who is? And if you define prayer as speaking to God, then that means the Father prays too because he speaks to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, right? See, now Paradox just asked me a question when I asked for the definition of prayer. What do you mean praying to the saints? What do you mean praying to the saints? May the Lord crucify our flesh and constrain us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to begin in a moment. I just wait a few minutes before people show up. We usually go over 100. What do you mean praying to the saints? How do you define prayer? Yes, he was acting as our intercessor and mediator, as our high priest, who offering up his soul, his life as a sacrifice for our sins, <clears throat> intercedes on the basis of that sacrifice to procure, to guarantee our forgiveness. But in another sense, because he's one with the Father, he too has the power to forgive. Right? Prayer can be talking to God, Pablo, but it can also mean worshiping God, singing to God, praising God, right? So you need to define prayer. If you if you define prayer as worship, well, you worship God alone. If you define prayer as singing praises, then you only sing praises to God alone. If you define prayer as requesting your prayers to be answered, God alone answers your prayers. So if that's how you define it, then you pray to God alone. But if you broaden the definition of prayer, listen to what I'm saying. It's okay, Andy Shannon. Your love and support is more than enough because we have a father that's infinitely rich. And he loves us and we trust in him. So thank you, brother. Now, let's go back to the issue. If you, if you broaden definition of prayer to mean fellowship, communion, speaking, right or even in the sense of asking someone to ask god to do something for you right for example if i say pray for me that request telling you to pray for me if you define prayer to mean also requesting someone to pray for you then that's your definition of prayer so this is why i don't answer a question without first asking the person how do you define prayer? Because this is where it gets tricky and people get confused and assume prayer only means worship. Prayer only means glorification. No, prayer is more than that. Yes, prayer is <clears throat> worshiping God, glorifying God, singing praises to God, but it's more than that. It's also speaking to God, having intimate communion with God, intimate <clears throat> speaking with God, right? Man, Bill Thompson, God have mercy on you and protect you, bro. I hope you don't go through a third one, man. Wow. Talk about bad luck. Maybe you should become a Protestant uh, monk. No, actually, I got one, Lopez. This is the new Mac that because of the generous support of brothers and sisters, David Wood purchased for me. So thank you. God bless you for your generosity, right? But we're about to be in a few more minutes. So we're going to need to define terms, though, because if you want me to address this, right? So you only ask the Father 
to let us get forgiveness of our sin? You don't ask Jesus Christ to forgive you or the Holy Spirit to forgive you? So why are you limiting praying for forgiveness as praying to the Father alone? Don't you pray to the Son to forgive? Don't you pray to the Holy Spirit to forgive? If the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God, and God alone forgives sins, that means the Father can forgive you because he's God. The Son can forgive you because he's God. The Holy Spirit can forgive you because he's God. Okay? Right? You're asking me a question not related to the topic right now, Moab. You see what the topic is, communion of the saints and salvation by grace. I may answer that a little later. We'll just wait. Okay. So the topic, you guys know what the topic is, right? Communion of the saints and salvation by grace. I know people are going to get offended, but look, I'm not here to offend you, but I'm not here to tickle your ears. Listen, no one wants to be disliked, but at the same time, when you believe something to be true, you have to take a stand for truth, even though it may get you in trouble because God is truth. He's a God of truth and he's not honored when we lie, distort the truth to tickle ears, right? So by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to try to be as faithful to the truth of God as I understand it by the grace of God's spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Okay. Let's now look at a couple of passages. In fact, I needed to address, see, there's so many things I want to address. Not only do a series on refuting the assertion that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, I want to also talk about this dispensationalist <clears throat> interpretation that the Jewish apostles of Jesus preached repentance and baptism in Jesus' name for salvation. And when the Jews rejected Jesus, then God raised up Paul to teach the message of salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus, right? I want to address that because that's a distortion of the New Testament. It's a distortion of the book of Acts. I also wanted to clarify a few things on tithing, right? But anyway, I'm going to stick to what I said. We're going to talk about Cunis Saints. See, Paradox, you did it again. Paradox, I hope you're not a troublemaker and that you're here to learn because, Paradox, you got about five minutes before I'm going to block you. You again accused the Assyrian church of worshiping Mary and the saints. I just got done explaining that they define terms differently than you. And there is no Assyrian who knows his faith or her faith that says they worship Mary and the saints. See, this is what I don't like. I get very angry and impatient with people who misrepresent others, whether Catholics must misrepresent Protestants, Orthodox misrepresent Protestants, or vice versa. And you're on a roll of misrepresentation. Paradox, do you really want to learn, or should I just block you because you're going to be a troublemaker, and I sense you're going to cause division? Okay. Let me just see the, the spirit in which this guy's operating because I sense he is a troublemaker, a tool to try to cause division. So I'm going to have to probably just block him. Okay, just one second, guys. I'm not saying there aren't people in these traditions who in their ignorance do take their devotion, adoration too far and borders idolatry and worship. Right. What I am saying is that those who know their tradition and understand it will deny that they worship the saints or Mary. They'll they'll tell you that's blasphemy. Now, whether they're right or wrong, that's what we're going to discuss. OK. And guys, try to focus your comments, your questions on the topic. So I just want to see paradox. I want to see if that person is going to slip up because I don't want to waste time with troublemakers. OK, now. Orbiter, you ready? Come on, Richard Ems, you're killing me. Did you read the title of the discussion, Richard Ems? Yeah. How you doing? I'm going to shock a lot of Protestants because they think I'm going one direction and I'm going another. So Perez, get ready to get shocked. Okay, Orbiter, I want you to first go to Galatians chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah. Galatians chapter 1, verse 2. I'm pleased to see you too, Richard, but not too, too much, unless you got a bag of M&Ms, peanut M&Ms. Galatians 1, verse 10. If I said to forgive me, Lord, loosen my tongue. I meant Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Okay, Paradox, just sit back and listen and don't misrepresent 
the belief of the Assyrian church because you're Assyrian. You should know better. Yeah, paradox. You are a paradox. Galatians 1.10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I'm going to repeat that passage two more times. Post it again. I'm going to read that two more times. Guys, pay attention, please. Okay, Pay attention. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, focus. For do I now persuade men? Paul is talking about. Do I come to try to persuade men or do I try to persuade or more accurately please God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You understand what Paul is saying? Paul is saying, I'm going to say some things that are hard hitting and will offend you, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, especially Christians that I, by the grace of God's spirit, led to saving faith. But I don't want to offend you, but at the same time, I'm not here to tickle your ears. If speaking the truth will offend you, so be it, because I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm here to make him happy, not you. And I hope that you too want to make Jesus happy and we're on the same page. You understand? And that's the attitude I want to have by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not here to persuade you or please you, but I'm not here to offend you as well. I'm going to speak the truth to the best of my understanding. I may be wrong. Don't condemn me. Take what I have to say. Go back and prayerfully study it. And if you see I'm wrong, amen. Ask the Spirit to show me where I'm wrong. Okay? And then again, Galatians 4, 14 to 16. Galatians 4, verses 14 to 16, specifically verse 16. Now, I, like yesterday, I shocked a lot of Catholics and Orthodox upon John 6, 53. I promise you I'm going to shock you Protestants today. I promise you. Galatians 4, 14 to 16. I said I was going to read Galatians 1, 10, three times, right? Okay, here, let me read it more time. For I do now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What's Paul's point? You cannot be a Christ pleaser and a crowd pleaser. It cannot work. You're going to offend one and try to please the other. Now, Galatians 4, 14 to 16. Read with me and thank our brother Orbiter for posting. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not. He's talking about how much the Galatians loved them initially, but now they're turning against him. He's like, what happened? You loved me so much that when I had this temptation, this, this thorn in my flesh, you didn't despise me. You sympathized with me, nor rejected, but received me. You received me as an angel of God. You received me as if I was Christ Jesus. That's how much you loved me. Now notice 15 to 16. Watch here. Look what he says. Pay attention. Where is then the blessedness he speak, spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. That's how much you loved me. You would have died for me. But now watch here, Galatians 4.16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now I'm your enemy. Now you hate me because I have to rebuke you and chasten you for following a false gospel, for being deceived by false Christians preaching a false gospel. Let's post it, Galatians 4, 16, one more time. One more time. Galatians 4, 16, one more time. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, this is the thing. Now, I may be wrong. I may be misinterpreting Scripture, thinking I'm interpreting the Scriptures correctly. The fact is, though, I'm not here trying to preach something that's a lie. Trusting the Spirit to correct me. I'm going to share with you again. How I see the truth of Scripture related to this topic, trusting the Holy Spirit will protect me and correct me from error and protect you from error in doing so. Now, what's the topic? Let me define communion of saints. Communion of the saints basically means that everyone who's born of the Spirit, listen up, folks. Let me give you a definition. Everyone who's born of the Spirit is united to Christ, forming his spiritual body. <clears throat> Can you hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah, internet connection. Pray that it stays strong. Okay. All of us who are born of the Spirit are united to Christ as our spiritual head, and we form his spiritual body called the church. And we are interconnected and interdependent, right? And we have communion with one another, fellowship with one another, intimate, loving communion with one, one another, and we are intimately connected so that we cannot function separately and apart from one another. A beautiful passage that teaches this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Read the entire chapter. But for the sake of time, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. you got to read the entire chapter. I don't have time to do that. 
right? So the communion of saints basically refers to the fact all true believers born of the Spirit are united to one another and to Christ as our head who nourishes us, who sustains us, who feeds us and gives us every blessing and gift that we need to grow in him. And this union makes us interdependent so that we cannot exist and function separately because we need one another and the unique gifts that the others have as we depend on Jesus for all these graces. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. Now that's Orbiter's fault. I didn't say chapter 1. You make a mistake and I'll stone you. I don't know what you mean starting five minutes. I announced 6.30. So it's all right. You're, you didn't miss too much. You can go back and listen. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14. You make that mistake, Orbiter, and you get, you get stoned. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit immerses us into the body of Jesus Christ, becoming his body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bound, or free, bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. So there's one body made up of many members. This is the community of saints. We are all the members of the body of Christ and depend on one another and have intimate communion with one another and with Jesus Christ. Is that clear? Before I move on. Now, as... Understood by Roman Catholicism, the Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, and the Assyrian Church, also known as the Nestorian Church. Communion of saints also refers to those saints in heaven who are glorified, right? <clears throat> They're glorified, beatified. They've experienced what we call the beatific vision. They behold God in his glory. Then the presence of Christ perfected free of sin. They are still connected to the body of Christ on earth, and we are still connected to them. On that basis, and because of that belief, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Orthodox tradition, the Assyrian Church of the East, known as the Nestorian Church, even though that's not what they call themselves, right? <clears throat> the Coptic tradition, the Coptic Church believe that because we are still one with them in the spirit and connected with them in the spirit, and they're still concerned for us, and they still love us, and they are perfected and free of sin, they continue to pray for us and ask God to help us. So they aid us by their prayers. You with me there? Are you with me there? Yep. You understand what the doctrine means? I don't, Renee. Okay, Black Smurf. Let me share it again. Those believers who have died in Christ and now are in heaven, are they still one with you in the spirit? Are they still part of the same body that you belong to, Black Smurf? Or are they cut off and separate from you? Aid, A-I-D. Richard Ems, I hope you're not joking with me. I hope you're listening. I didn't say eight, man. Aid. Right. You assume so? Why would death separate you from them? In other words, are the Christians in China still your brothers and sisters and one with you in the spirit, though physically not in your presence? Why would location separate them? Of course they are. Don't assume so. Yes, they are. They are still members of the body of Christ. In fact, they're more alive than you and I because they're free of sin and they don't struggle with sin and succumb to sin anymore. Okay. Now, because of that, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Coptic tradition, right, the Orthodox tradition, the Assyrian Church of the East, all believe that because they're still connected to us, they still love us and care for us and are concerned for us. And so they go before the triune God and ask the triune God to help us. So they come to our aid, A-I-D. Just like on earth, I pray for you, you pray for me, right? They are praying for us. Now, they don't need our prayers for them because they're glorified, they're perfected. We're the ones still struggling with sin and evil. You understand the doctrine? Do you understand the doctrine? Okay, before I move on. 
Now, I'm going to ask for you to help me and walk in truth. Don't help me by posting verses. Please wait. Be patient, please. One thing I'm going to ask you, be patient. Don't go ahead of me and don't throw verses. Listen and don't argue with me yet. Hear it out. Take the verses I'm going to give you, and then you come to your own conclusion. Now, here's the objection. The objection given by predominantly Protestants. Well, those in heaven are not aware of the plight of Christians on earth, and they're unable to hear our requests for them to pray to us. Now, let me explain what the communion of saints does not teach. It does not teach that the saints in heaven answer your prayers because all traditions agree only God, God alone, the triune God, has the power to answer, answer prayers. What they teach is that they go before God with your pleas and ask God to answer your prayers. See? Metal, we're going to get rid of you because you're a blasphemous dog. This is how I treat dogs who come here and act stupid. Hold on. Bye-bye, Metal. See? I told you. Uh, listen, I'm not politically correct. I'm not going to put up with your stupidity. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Fortunately, it turned out to somebody I know. Shame on him. But anyway, God have mercy on him. Okay, are you with me there? Okay, Sa El Nom. Didn't I say be patient? Because now this is going to backfire against you. Why are you then asking Christians to pray for you? Why don't you speak to God directly? Do you understand what you just did? If you ever, Sa El Nom, ask another Christian to pray for you, then you're not going to God directly. You're violating your own question. Why would you even bring that up? Philip, it's okay. Be patient, brother. Be patient because I already know what's going to happen, so I have to control and rein people in. Don't ever bring up these objections. This is why I want to repeat again for the third time. Be patient. Don't raise objections that I'm going to address. Be patient. Okay. Are we ready? Are we ready now? So here's the real objection. Here's the real objection. Is there biblical warrant, biblical basis to show that people in heaven, angels in heaven, saints in heaven, are aware of things that take place on earth, are aware of the plight of Christians on earth? See, that's the real question. Because the objection is they're dead to us and they're aware, unaware of what takes place on earth. Guess what? The Bible says they are alive to God and they are aware of things on earth. Are you now ready for the evidence? Are you ready now to get in the saddle and not fight me and hear the evidence? Are you guys ready? Okay, let's begin. Luke 15, verse 7 and 10. Like I tell you, Protestants are going to get angry with me and they're going to say, oh, Sam Shimon, he's becoming a heretic, he's becoming a Catholic. No, I'm not being Catholic or Orthodox. I'm a Biblicist. So don't go and falsely accuse me. Right? Luke 15, 7 and 10. Let's follow. Now let's listen. You really want to learn? Let's listen. Okay. I say unto you, the Lord says, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. Did you catch it? When a person repents on earth, there is joy in heaven. Now Luke 15, 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Question. How can angels in heaven, the inhabitants of heaven, rejoice over sinners repenting on earth if the inhabitants of heaven are unaware of what takes place on earth? Now, during this time, the only beings in heaven were angels. But I'm going to show you it extends to even human believers who are now glorified in the presence of Christ. But let me repeat my question. How can angels in heaven, those in heaven, rejoice over sinners on earth repenting if they're not aware of what's taking place on earth? Matthew 18, verse 10. I don't know. Do you want me to block you? I don't know. Because you're now making it a fight between Orthodox and Protestants. Do you want me to send you on your merry way? 
Sit and listen, or I'm going to send you off. Matthew 18, 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. He's talking about children, but he's also talking about spiritual babes, physical and spiritual babes. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now here the Lord is warning people. He's warning them. Listen, guys, he's warning them. Do not cause these children to stumble. And he's not just talking about physical children, but spiritual babes. Because I'm letting you know, they have angels assigned to them, beholding the face of my father. Is the voice okay? I don't know why it would be cutting off. Is it okay? In Jesus' name, may the Lord protect us from attack. Okay. Okay. So now my question again. My question again. What is Jesus trying to get at by saying, hey, you don't cause these little ones to stumble because their angels behold the face of my father. What is he saying? He's warning them, right? They have angels interceding for them before my father. Do you understand the implication? Let's look at Matthew 18, 10 one more time. Matthew 18, 10 verse one more time. We're just beginning. We still have a lot more. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You see what he's saying? Be careful. I'm warning you. There are angels. Behold the face of my Father. That's a warning. They have angels that pray for them before God to do something against those who harm them. Here's my question. How can angels before the Father's face in heaven, right, be aware of what's taking place to these little ones on earth and therefore know how to pray for them. Can you answer that question? Before I move on, what does Matthew 18 10 imply? What does that imply? Can you guys hear me? Um, there's no responses. Not only does God allow it, how could the angels know to pray for these little ones before the Father in heaven if, not, if they're not aware of what's taking place to these little ones on earth? Dominus answered because they know. So who told you that angels in heaven are not aware of the plight of people on earth? Okay, now let's look at Abraham's example. Luke 16, 27 to 31. Now, Larry, if I have to answer that question, Larry, Aragon, you know I'm going to block you, right? It, whether some or few, you're admitting that there are people who are aware in heaven. Okay. Okay, now, Luke 16, 27 to 31. Read with me. Luke 16, 27 to 31. The rich man, Lazarus, and Abraham. The rich man is tormented in Hades. He beholds Abraham and Lazarus afar. Afar. Let's read Luke 16, 27 to 31. Read with me. Guys, read. Then the rich man said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, asking Abraham, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So he's saying, look. Send Lazarus to my father's house so that my brothers will be warned so they can repent and not end up in this torment like me. Now notice Abraham's response. Pay attention, folks. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, meaning the writings of Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them read the scriptures. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. If one from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. Now notice Abraham's response in 31. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Question. Moses and the prophets came hundred years, hundreds of years after Abraham, and he's referring to what they had on earth at the time of this conversation, and he's referring to their writings. How did Abraham know that the inhabitants of the earth, the Jews, had the writings of Moses and the prophets when Abraham died before any of the prophets wrote any scripture.
How did he know that? <clears throat> because God made him aware of what's taking place on earth. Guys, any answer you give, good to see you, Jacob, Jacob. Good to see you, man. I'm glad you're here to learn. Any answer you give, you're basically admitting that those in the netherworld, in the spiritual realm, are made aware of what's taking place on earth. You get it now? And Abraham wasn't even in the presence of God in heaven. At this time, and I'll prove it later, all those who died didn't enter God's heavenly presence where the angels dwell before the visible glory of God. They went to what we call Abraham's bosom. And yet in that place, Abraham knew the plight of his people, his descendants on earth, because he knew they had the scriptures. So that means he was aware that God had taken out his descendants from Egypt because Moses the deliverer came, and he was aware that Moses wrote about it because after all, the five books of Moses is all about this theory of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their descendants living in Egypt, and then God sending Moses to deliver them in the wilderness and Joshua bringing them into the promised land. That means Abraham knew all of that. If he knew about their writings, then he knew about their circumstances. How? How? How do you know about Moses' writings but don't know that Moses was a prophet sent to deliver Abraham's descendants out of Egypt and they spent time in the wilderness and then were brought into the promised land by Joshua? That means he knew all of this, right? Oh, but the dead don't know what's taking place on earth. Who told you this? Right? Everyone with me, right? You're following with me so far, right? Ah, oh, but they're dead. Let's see if they're dead. Luke 20, 37 to 38. If you just be patient with me, step by step, I'll make the case. Be patient with me, step by step, I'll make the case. Luke 20, 37, 38. Watch here. Luke 20, 37, 38. Are they dead? Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Now that the dead are raised, you posted 37 again. I'm waiting for 38. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now notice 38. For he's not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. Who told you they're dead? They're more alive than you and I. They are free of sin. And struggles and trials, they are now perfected. And I'll get more into that in a minute. Let's go to Revelation 6, 9 to 11 real quickly. Revelation 6, 9 to 11 real quickly. Even if he's there, Perez, that still doesn't nullify the fact that Abraham is aware of circumstances after his death, but you're trying to explain away because Moses was there. That's not going to help you because... <clears throat> Hold on. Perez, that's not going to help you because Abraham also knew the plight of the rich man. Or I'm freezing up. Hold on. Perez, that's not going to help you because Abraham also knew the plight of the rich man and Lazarus when they entered his presence. He knew how the rich man lived and he knew how Lazarus lived when they entered his presence. In fact, let's look at it. Go to Luke 16. Let's read 24 to 26. Luke 16, 24, 20, because Perez is trying to explain away. Oh, but they were there. They told him. Perez, that's kind of desperate. You're stretching it because you've already made up your mind what can and cannot be biblical. Even if we agree with you, they were there. How did he know they had the scriptures on earth in their possession? Which of the prophets knew that they had the entire canon of scripture in their possession on earth? Well, let's go to Luke 16, 24 to 26. Read with me. Okay, read with me. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things. How did Abraham know that? And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. How did Abraham know that? 
but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. How did he know that? Perez, I think you want to debate me, and I think you're going to last less than 10 minutes. How did he know how he lived on earth? Just because he's in torment doesn't mean he lived lavishly all his life. And how did he know that Lazarus all his life was in evil misery? Just because he's there in his side doesn't mean he knows the entire plight of his life. You're trying desperate to deny the scripture. And Perez, I'm sorry, but if you're going to oppose me, I'm going to have to treat you likewise. See, this is what happens when you made up your mind and you're too Protestant, not biblical. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Now, Prez, if you still explain this away, my brother, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to send you on your way. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Let's see how you're going to explain this away. No, you're not, brother. You are opposing me. That's okay. I love you, bro. You know I love you. I won't be tough with you. I'm an equal opportunist offender. I offend friends and foes alike. At least you got to give me that. I'm not politically correct and nice. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Now, Perez, please explain this away. Here, Perez, listen. Explain this away. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Pay attention. The word of God and for the testament which they held. Pay attention. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now, Perez, explain this away. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Perez, did you see that Jesus told them that there are going to be more people killed on earth and there's a number of them who'll be killed and when that number is up, then he'll avenge their blood? So now here, Perez, you have Jesus telling them future events that will take place on earth. Explain that away, Perez. Why is Jesus telling them about the plight of Christians on earth that more Christians will be killed because of me and when the full number is up, then I'll avenge you? So don't try to explain away the fact that Abraham is aware of things on earth because you're going to have a hard time explaining Revelation 6, 9 to 11 away. But it's going to get even worse for my brother present. I say this out of love. I don't mean to single him out, but see, sometimes you got to be tough, okay? Do you remember Revelation 18? Babylon is destroyed. Babylon is destroyed, right? On earth, it's destroyed. And Perez is a brother in the Lord Jesus, so. But remember in Revelation 18, Babylon is destroyed in an hour, right? Because we don't have time to read the entire chapter, Revelation 18. But now let's go to Revelation 19, verses 1 to 4. No, it's not that they see everything we do necessarily on earth, Zena. But we do have enough evidence to show that God does make them aware of things on earth. Does he make them aware of everything on earth? That's not in the scripture. That's what I'm saying. I can't tell you how much they know, how much they see, but they do see and know certain events in the life of Christians. Now, Revelation 19, verses 1 to 4. Guys, pay attention. Pay attention here. Revelation 19, verses 1 to 4. Pay attention, guys, please. Verse 1, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, in heaven, much people, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. How did the people in heaven know the great whore on earth had been judged and destroyed and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand? And again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And then verse 4, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. So guys, how did the people in heaven know God had just destroyed that great whore Babylon on earth who made the earth drink of her fornication? How did they know that? Yeah, by the way, he's our brother. Diago Perez is, my, is our brother. So calm down, guys. Don't attack him. He's my brother. So he allows me to attack him because he loves me. And I attack him in a brother way. You know what I mean? So Perez is a brother. Okay, but here's my question again. 
How did the people in heaven know about the destruction of Babylon on earth? The whore of Babylon. No, it's the it's the city from which the beast reigned. How did they know? Oh, so now you're admitting, Zena and Renee, God does show the inhabitants of heaven events on earth. Are you following with me before I move on? So when a Protestant, and by the way, I'm a Protestant evangelical, just for the record. My tradition is evangelical. I still affirm sola fide, sola scriptura. So don't think I'm getting, you know, become a heretic on it. Not, you know. The Protestant are scared. Oh, Sam's going to become. No, I believe sola scriptura, sola fide. But because I believe in sola scriptura, I accept now the communion of saints. Because of sola scriptura. Did you know that? Okay. But when you admit, when you admit that God can make the inhabitants of heaven aware of things on earth, you destroy the argument that Protestants often raise, well, they don't know about the plight of Christians on earth. So here's my question to every one of you. If God can show them, God can show them. Emmanuel, you got a minute to leave because I'm going to block you. God can show them events on earth. Why can't God make them aware that there's someone here asking you to pray for them? Mickey, can you stop bringing up another issue about Sola Scriptura? Please, don't change the subject. And if you want to debate that, we will. Mickey, don't bring us. See, Mickey, uh, you're not going to last. Uh, you hear them. Mickey, I got to say bye to you. Sorry, bro. Sorry, brother. We're talking about something. Mickey talks about Sola Scriptura and Orthodox. Bye-bye. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Forgive me, but I'm not going to pull punches. Sorry about that. Okay, I will. Black Smurf, where you go? Okay. Yep. Yeah, guys, don't answer these questions. What is Sola Scriptura? Jacob, Jacob, just there's some they're just mocking. Focus, focus. Okay, focus. So, again, did the Lord Jesus make martyrs aware that there'll be other Christians killed on earth? And there's a number of them, and when they're killed, then he'll avenge them? So, did the Lord Jesus reveal to them? What's going to take place, not just at that time, but in the future? Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Did all the inhabitants of heaven know that God had just destroyed that great city, the whore of Babylon? The one who made all the nations drink of her fornication? Did God make them aware of that? And they celebrate and praise God for that? Do the angels before the face of the Father... Know what's taking place with these little ones. What's happening to these little ones. For them then to know how to ask the Father and pray for the Father on their behalf. Matthew 18, 10. Do the angels in heaven know when a sinner repents on earth, causing them to rejoice in heaven? Luke 15, 7 to 10. Just me, I just said, the city... Is, is the whore of Babylon, the city on seven hills, which is why many people take it to mean Rome. But don't worry about the city, just me. You want to focus on the city or communion of saints? Okay. Now, Lord willing, in another session, I'm going to get you quotations from Jewish sources that confirm that Rachel, Jacob's wife, intercedes for the Jews even though she's been dead. Because I'm going to use another passage in a minute. But everyone with me so far? Everyone with me so far? Okay, now I'm going to have to bring in the deuterocanonical writings known as the Apocrypha. Because though, though Protestants and Jews reject them today, these books have been accepted as scripture by the Orthodox, by the Roman Catholic, and I also believe the Coptic tradition. But you don't have to accept their inspiration in order to see the point I'm about to make. Now, let me first ask 
Orbiter, can you post Tobit chapter 12 versus, well, here, let me do it. No, I don't think I can. All right, I'm going to read it for you guys. I'm going to read it for you guys. Tobit chapter 12, verses 11 to 12, 20. I'm going to read it from the Common English Bible. Write it down, Tobit chapter 12, verses 11 to 20. Are you ready? Now, you do not have to accept it as sacred scripture to see the point I'm about to make. Yeah, Jacob's wife, Rachel, was believed by the Jews to be interceding for the children of Israel even after her death. I have the citations, but I don't have them now. We'll talk about that later. Don't focus on that. Okay, Tobit chapter 12, verse 11, 20. Guys, pay attention, please, because I'm going to show you that this portion in Tobit is confirmed in principle in the book of Revelation. I'm going to read. So please, guys, give me your undivided attention for the sake of the Lord. Learn something. If you still reject it, that's fine. Tobit chapter 12, verses 11 to 20. Tobit 12, 11 to 20. I'm going to read. This is the angel Raphael. He's now identifying himself. <clears throat> and he begins by saying, I will tell you the whole truth, and I will keep nothing secret from you. This is from the Common English Bible translation. Tobit chapter 12, verse 11 to 20. I have already said to you, it's good to hide a king's secret from you and good to reveal God's works in an honorable way. So when you and Sarah prayed, watch what he says. This is verse 12. So when you and Sarah prayed, it was I who brought the record of your prayer into God's glorious presence. And likewise, when you used to bury the dead and when you didn't hesitate to get up and leave your dinner to go and bury the corpse. Now, let me give you the quote. The angel Raphael says... Tobit, chapter 12, verse 12. Read it now. So when you and Sarah prayed, it was I, the angel. Darn it. What happened? Hold on. Hey, uh, are you, am I still on? Sorry, guys, I lost connection. Am I on? Boy, the devil is angry, folks. So I didn't lose the recording, right? Good. Glory to Jesus Christ. You see, that's good. We're being attacked. I take that as spiritual warfare, so we plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, cover us with the blood of Jesus and seal us by your spirit. Father, rebuke the evil one in Jesus' name by the power of the blood of Christ, by the fire of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Man, talk about attacks, huh? My connection, everything. That means we're doing something good. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Okay, one more time. Hallelujah. Tobit chapter 12, verse 12. Here's the key verse. Read again. Watch here. Guys, read with me. So when you and Sarah prayed, the angel Raphael says, it was I who brought the record of your prayer into God's glorious presence. And likewise, when you used to bury the dead. Okay, read it one more time. Read it. Now I'm going to continue the citation. Verse 13. And when you didn't hesitate to get up and leave your dinner to go and bury the corpse, I was sent to test you then. And at the same time, God sent me to heal you and Sarah, your son's bride. I am Raphael, one of the seven angels who stand ready and who enter the Lord's glorious presence. Pay attention to the two things here. I am Raphael. And did you notice he says I was sent to heal you? People don't know why he said he was sent to heal them because Rafa means heal, means heal. Rafa El means God heals. So the angel's name is God heals. Like when you say Yahovah Rafa, the Lord heals. So he goes, I am the angel given the power to heal because I am Rafa, heal, il. Il is the word for God. God heals and he uses me to heal. Okay, but now let me post that verse again. Notice what he says. I am Raphael, one of the seven angels who stand ready and enter the Lord's glorious presence. So two things I want you to remember. Guys, two things. He said, I'm the one who carried your prayer to God, and I'm one of the seven angels who enter the Lord's glorious presence. Can you remember those two things? I, Raphael, am the angel who takes your prayer to God, who took your prayer to God. When you prayed to God, I took it to him. Right? Verse 12. And then here in 15, he says, I am one of the seven angels who enters the Lord's glorious presence. Can you remember that? 
You can you remember these two things? Can you remember these two things so I can finish the citation? You guys with me, right? Okay. Let me read the rest of it because you're going to see where I'm going with this. Because even you Protestants who don't accept this as canonical, and I accept the Jewish canon of 39 Old Testament books, but I'm not one of those who say if you accept these as scripture, you're wrong. That Anyway, even those of you who reject that this is inspired, it still tells us what the Jews believe before the time of Christ. And I'll unpack it in a minute. Let me read 16 and 20 now. The two were shocked. They fell on their faces in fear. But Raphael said to them, don't be afraid. Be at peace. Praise God for all time. While I was with you, it wasn't because I was showing you any favor, but because God's will. Now notice what the angel did not say. He didn't say praise me. As a creature who serves, praise God all time. Praise him all your days and sing to him. So praise him and sing to him. You were observing me, but I wasn't eating or drinking anything. Instead, you were seeing a vision. Now praise the Lord here on earth and acknowledge God. Notice that I'm ascending to the one who sent me. So record everything that has happened to you. Then Raphael ascended. That was Tobit chapter 12, verses 11 and 20. So notice what he said. Praise God. Praise and sing to God, to the Lord. Glorify him. I'm a servant. Come to heal you. And I'm the one who takes your prayers to God. And I'm one of seven angels who stands in the Lord's presence. Now, you don't have to accept this as scripture to see that this is an indication that there were some, many, most Jews, that believed in this angel named Raphael and believed that angels would mediate our prayers to God and that angels could be sent to heal. So notice what you're learning, learning about the Jews before the time of Christ. Are you ready for me to unpack this? The Jews before the time of Christ believed there were at least seven angels that stood in the presence of God, one of whom's name was Raphael. They believed that these angels, specifically Raphael, would mediate our prayers to God. He was a mediator that would take our prayers to God. You guys see what's happening here? God is using an angelic creature to mediate our prayers to him. Seven angels in God's presence. An angel who mediates takes the prayers of God's people to God, right? So here is a Jewish book that shows us this is what some, if not most of the Jews, believed before the time of Christ. Right? Now, for those of you who don't accept Tobit, guess what, folks? Revelation confirms Tobit is correct. Member 7, and angels take our prayers to God. Here's the shocker, folks. Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 5. Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 5. So Revelation confirms that this episode that says there are seven angels in God's presence and angels takes our prayers to God, that's true. The story may not be true. The story of Tobit may not be true. But the fact that there are seven angels in the presence of God and angels take our prayers to God, that part of the book is true because it's confirmed by Revelation. And we all accept Revelation as scripture. Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 5. Count, folks. Count. And I saw, I saw the seven angels which stood before God. Wow, that's Tobit, chapter 15, verse 15. And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the altar, which was before the throne. Whoa. An angel is before the altar performing priestly duties. This is a priestly angelic creature serving as a priest in the heavenly temple at the heavenly altar, offering incense and our prayers he offers to God. Why? Why? Verse 4. Let's read 4. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. Why? 
Marazi, I'll do you even better. I'm going to send you on your merry way. Hey, Marazi, before I send you on your way, can you show me a verse where it says pray to the Holy Spirit? Can you show me a verse that says pray to the Holy Spirit? Marazi, answer the question before I block you. Hold on. I just want to give this guy a chance to embarrass himself. Marazi, answer the question quickly. Show me the verse that says you can pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Because that's what you're asking, an explicit verse. Okay. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. No, those seven angels are not angelic <clears throat> spirit creatures, but human messengers assigned to the authority of the church. Jacob, Jacob, don't confuse too many issues here because the term angel can refer to a spirit creature or a human messenger. And I'll prove that later. I don't have time right now, Jacob, Jacob. Okay. Now, folks, don't misunderstand me. We do pray to the Holy Spirit because he's God. What I'm saying is, do you have an explicit verse saying, pray to the Holy Spirit? Just because you don't find something explicit, does that mean we don't pray to the Holy Spirit? Because that's what he's asking me. Let's come back to Revelation 8. Let's look at 3 and 4 again. Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Revelation 8, 3 and 4. One more time. Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Are you guys getting bored with this information? And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Prayers of all saints. The angel is offering the prayers of believers on the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God out of the angel's hands. You understand the implication of this? You understand what you're being told here? This angel is before the altar. This angel offers incense on the altar and the prayers of the saints. This angel is a priestly angel. And he's mediating before God on behalf of God's people. Because what do priests do? They intercede. Folks, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? What in the world is this angel doing interceding for the people of God when I thought 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's only one mediator? And I already explained the misuse and abuse of that passage yesterday. And I'll go more in depth. I promise you I'm going to have to do a part three. Okay. Everyone understands so far. Do you see how much evidence there is in scripture that folks in heaven are aware of things on earth and that you have, at least in the case of angelic creatures, <clears throat> bringing our prayers before God, functioning as priestly intercessors for the pe people of God, in union with Christ. Don't be confused. Let the Bible inform your doctrine, Dave McIntosh. The Bible says he offered the prayers of the saints to God. That's biblical teaching. Let the Bible inform you. See, here we go with Diago. Uh, Perez, brother, uh, you got to leave right now. I'm sorry, bro. I'm going to have to do this to you. Okay. Hold on. Sorry, brother. Um, no hard feelings, man. I'm going to have to remove you. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry, bro. I'm going to just have to even block you from my page. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Can you believe the audacity of the guy? Oh, angels and the saints are the same thing? Yes, because angels are called saints. Yeah, soul sleep is not biblical. Do you want me to get rid of you too? Say that again, Sai, so I can send you on your way. No, Sai, Christian. See, you come in lately or Johnny come lately. Don't know that this guy's been giving me a hard time for the last 10 minutes. Okay. And for the record, angels are called saints, holy ones. 
And it's unfortunate because he's a brother in the Lord. But like I said, as you can see, I'm very fair, right? I'm an equal opportunist defender. <clears throat> Friend or foe alike, I offend you because I love you the same. Okay, now, before I move on, so far, so good. Is it clear? So far, so good. Making sense? Uh, St. Michael, hold on. Uh, let me let me let me show you how old I am, brother. Hold on. Hold on. Let me show you how old I am. Hold on, bro. All right, that's how old I am. Okay. You guys haven't gotten lost in the discussion, right? You with me so far? Those of you who've been following, you with me so far. You haven't gotten lost in the discussion? So the book of Tobit, when it says there's an angel named Raphael, he's one of seven angels before God, and he brings the prayers of God's people to God. Even though that story may not be historical, I know people believe it is. Does Revelation confirm at least the fact that there are seven angels before God, and there's another angel who's a priestly angel that offers our prayers to God on the altar, functioning as a priestly angel and intercessor? Does at least... Revelation confirm those portions of Tobit. So you may reject Tobit, but can you reject Revelation? I don't know what you're asking, Glenn. Our prayers to God, saints take it to him. Yeah, well, yes, the saints, because angels are also called saints, Take our prayers to God, but are you asking me, can we ask saints to pray for us? I'm still not there yet. Just be patient. No, as long as you're commenting or asking questions sincerely, not trying to catch me up and prove me wrong, don't do it. Okay. Jonathan Soko, you're confusing me. I don't know if you're criticizing me or you're with me. I really don't know. Okay, with me so far? See, this is why I don't like to talk about these topics. It gets too controversial. People get too offended, right? But at the same time, anyway. Now, the, the angel is not the only one who offers our prayers to, the, to, to God. Let's go to Revelation 5.8. Revelation 5.8. Thank you, Michael Deke. I love you, bro. At least here's, here's a brother that's a very open-minded Protestant. And again, for the record, I'm a Protestant evangelical, so don't go accusing me, oh, Sam's a closet Roman Catholic Orthodox. As long as the Holy Spirit guides me into all truth, I'll be whatever the Holy Spirit wants me to be. Could be. There are people who get offended at that. I have no idea. Anyway, Revelation 5a, one more time. Revelation, exactly, Biblicists. I prefer to call myself a Biblicist. Guys, read Revelation 5a. The angel is not the only one who takes the prayers of God's people to God. Notice Revelation 5.8. Exactly. Whatever the Bible teaches. No, let's read Revelation 5.8 one more time. Guys, pay attention. The 24 elders and the four living creatures do what? We're waiting for Revelation 5.8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. What in the world are these spirit creatures doing with the prayers of saints in their hands, offering it to the Lamb? Why are the prayers in their hands? Why are they transmitting the prayers to God? Why are they mediating the prayers to God? Why? Edmund Dantas, you kept asking me if my, my ex-wife was Assyrian. Yes, she is. She's Assyrian. And I contacted you on, on Facebook. I don't know if you're here to learn or you're trying to attack. Are you trying to attack, bro? Edmund Dantas? Do you know why, Joseph? Because God allows it. God has no problem with spirit beings, spirit creatures in heaven, mediating the prayers of believers to him whether those prayers are offered in heaven 
or on earth. That's the point. God doesn't have a problem with it. You with me there? God doesn't have a problem with it. So if you are a biblicist, you believe the Bible, why should you have a problem with it? Now, did you see Revelation 5.8? It says they had golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, right? So those vials, golden vials that were full of odors, those are the prayers of saints, right? Revelation 5.8. You saw it, right? Because I'm going to tell you where the Old Testament confirms that. Psalm 141, verse 2. Psalm 141, verse 2. And by the way, I opposed this doctrine for years, but I did so in ignorance. Psalm 141, verse 2. Watch here. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Did you catch it? Let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You guys read that? Psalm 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be incense before you. And when I lift up my hands, let it be like the evening sacrifice. So in Revelation 5, 8 and Revelation 8, 3 to 4, you notice the four living creatures, 24 elders, had golden vials full of odors, incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and the angels offering incense and prayers together. Together. Because your prayer becomes sweet incense to God if your prayer is covered by the blood of Jesus. Man, I tired myself out with all this. Do I have still time? I'm going to have to do a part three. You know that, right? I'm going to have to do a part three. So far, did you see sufficient evidence to show that people in heaven, angels in heaven, people in heaven can be aware of things on earth and God makes them know about things on earth? Was that clear? Was that clear? Because I'm going to look at a few more before I go on. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 5, verses 8 to 14. Revelation 5, verses 8 to 14. No, Glenn, if you're asking sincere questions, I'm not, I don't get annoyed. I get annoyed when you ask a question, and not saying you, but you're not asking to learn, you're asking to challenge me. Because yesterday you kept asking Edmund Dantes if my ex-wife was a Syrian. I don't know why that would be a concern to you, but yeah, she was. Okay, Revelation 5, 8 to 14. Let's focus, guys. Revelation 5, 8 to 14. Read with me. Thank Orbiter. He's posting it. Revelation 5, 8 to 14. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and 20, 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Pay attention. Read 9 and 10 with me. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Guys, pay attention. And hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, here's where I need you to really pay attention. Verse 11. Verse 11. John says, and, beheld, and I beheld, I beheld, I saw. Guys, you got to pay attention to these verses. Start at 11. I beheld, I saw. And I heard. So I'm not just hearing, I'm seeing. Because he's in heaven before the throne. I saw and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Here is the most amazing part of this. Get ready to be blown away. Revelation 5, 13. <clears throat> Read with me. And every creature, watch, not some creatures, every creature which is in heaven. John is seeing all creatures in heaven, on the earth, all creatures on earth, under the earth, and as such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, 
Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. How in the world was John able to see every creature everywhere praising God and the Lamb? He heard and saw all of them. He heard and saw all creation, and he is part of them worshiping God and the Lamb. How? I thought that you have to be omniscient, omnipotent to hear multiple prayers. But John is a creature, limited, finite. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. And still God removed the veil and made the entire creation a present reality before John so that by the power of God, John saw all creation. And here's something else, folks. He's seeing men of every nation, language, and tongue praising God. How could John then understand various languages and know what they're saying in various languages? English, not Arabic. You know why? It's not because he understood all the different languages. It's because the Holy Spirit made those languages <clears throat> sound the same to his ears. So he wasn't hearing Swahili and Afrikaans and Arabic. He heard all the different people speaking a single language by the grace of God's spirit. So different languages all sounded the same to John's ears because that's how the Holy Spirit enabled them to hear. You with me there? So what more proof do you need that in the Bible, creatures in heaven can be enabled by God to hear people asking and praying on earth? John saw every creature in the whole creation worshiping God in various languages, but all the languages sounded the same to his ears by the grace of God's spirit. Who said in heaven, Ronnie, why are you misrepresenting me? Did you guys hear me say heaven? I said various nations and languages on earth because he heard every creature on earth. Okay. Do you guys need more proof? That the claim that those in heaven are not aware of things on earth and can't be aware of things on earth and are not able to hear someone ask for their help is not biblical. Yeah, we got a blasphemous pig, son of Satan, this guy Emmanuel. We got to get rid of him too. Hold on, sorry. Unless he wasn't mocking. Hold on. But because earlier he said something that troubled me. Emmanuel, are you mocking the scriptures in John? Or am I misreading your comment? I'm going to give you benefit of doubt. I'm going to assume because you said something earlier that offended me because I don't know if you're mocking. So the way you came off. Okay, just want to make sure. Forgive me, brother, if I'm reading too much in your statements because you did say something earlier that irked me, but maybe you didn't mean it to at attack the Lord. Forgive me, brother. May the Lord forgive me if you're a believer who loves Jesus and you're not mocking. So you're not mocking, right? You're not attacking the Bible or John, the servant of the Lord. Just want to make sure. Because I will not tolerate people mocking the scriptures, attacking the servants of God, belittling the triune God. I will not allow that. Okay. Because earlier he had said something that took me off guard. All right. Amanda, so you're a believer. You love the triune God. You love Jesus. Jesus is your God and Savior. And you honor his servants. Okay. God bless you, brother. So I just want to make sure. Forgive me because... I don't tolerate people who mock and blaspheme our God, insult the scriptures and his servants. Just wanted to be sure. So thank the Lord I asked before I did that. Okay. Okay. Is that clear so far? Okay, that's it. Because earlier, Jacob, Jacob, he had said something that sounded like he was mocking. That's why I reacted when he said John's blown away. I thought blown away like, oh, he got blown out of the water in an insulting manner. But anyway, brother. If you're a believer, the Lord bless you and forgive me. I just do not tolerate. I'm going to repeat again. You want to mock my mother? You want to mock my family? You want to mock me and saying I'm big, bald, and beautiful? That's fine. But you will not mock the triune God. You will not insult my Lord. 
You'll not attack the scriptures, insult his blessed servants like John without me blocking you. Just got to be careful because we love Jesus and we're all about glorifying him and seeking his honor. Just want to be careful. Okay. All right. With that said, let's look at the story of Rachel. I'm going to give you citations. Should I? Do I have them here now? No, I'll get you the citations later. Let's go to Matthew 2. Let's read Matthew 2, 13 to 22. Guys, don't be distracted by side conversation, like whether we should say Allah, because then you're going to lose focus. Matthew 2, 13 to 22. So you guys are now talking about whether Allah is appropriate or not. Come on, guys. Forget about that. Focus. Matthew 2, 13 to 22. Read with me. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Matthew 2, 13 to 22. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. <clears throat> When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now, guys, read. Read this, okay? And was there until the death of Herod that might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts, there, thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which had he had diligently, diligently inquired of the wise men. Now pay attention. Pay attention here. Okay. I don't know what you did here. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Then was fulfilled. Pay attention to 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, meaning Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Did you catch 17, 18? Post Matthew 2, 17, 18 one more time. Post Matthew 2, 17, 18 one more time. Matthew 2, 17, 18 one more time. Watch here. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Guys, Rachel is the wife of Jacob. She had been dead for nearly 2,000 years. And in Genesis 35, 16, 19, it says she died when she gave birth to Benjamin and she was buried in Bethlehem. Here it says that Rachel started weeping when her children in Bethlehem were killed. Can I ask you a question? Why would Rachel weep over children killed on earth if she wasn't aware that they were being slaughtered? How did she know to weep? And Lord willing, tomorrow I'll quote you Jewish tradition that says that Rachel actually prays and intercedes. She prays and intercedes. But it says she's weeping, marijuana or marijuana. It says she wept. When the slaughter of the Israelites took place, when they were exiled in Babylon, and when they were killed here in Bethlehem, this fulfilled what Jeremiah said. She wept. She wept over her children suffering. How is that possible? Did you catch it or no? But my question is, I know it's her bloodline got slaughtered, but how did she know they got slaughtered if she's not aware of things on earth? Who told you it's allegorical, medic? Your tradition? What makes it allegorical? What in the context makes it allegorical? And why use a dead figure indicating her grief over the plight of people who actually died, <clears throat> allegorizing the weeping and the suffering? Yep. It was made known to her. The Jews believed that Rachel and other figures like Jeremiah interceded for Israel. The Jews believed Rachel and prophets like Jeremiah interceded for Israel. Lord willing, I'll get you the citations. 
about Rachel interceding for the Israelites according to Jewish tradition. But I'm going to quote something that's accessible to every one of you. Second Maccabees, Second Maccabees chapter 15, verses 12 to 16. Second Maccabees chapter 15, verses 12 to 16. Judas Maccabees sees Onias die, priest who had been killed, right? I believe he was killed. Sorry if I'm in error. Pay attention, folks. I'm going to read it to you. Second Maccabees chapter 15, verses 12 to 16. In his vision, Judas saw Onias. I'm quoting from the in common English Bible. Guys, pay attention. Second Maccabees 15, verses 12 to 16. In his vision, Judas saw Onias, who had been high priest and was virtuous, good, modest in all things, gentle of merit manners, and well-spoken. Now watch here. Onias was dead, but Judas saw him in a vision. He saw the priest Onias who had died. He sees him in a vision, folks. Okay, From childhood, he had learned all things that properly belong to a good moral life. This man had his hands extended to pray for the entire nation of the Jews. Did you catch it? A dead priest in a vision is depicted to Judas Maccabees as extending his hands, praying for Israel, for the Jews. A dead priest. Are you catching it or no? Are you seeing this? That's 2 Maccabees chapter 15, 12 to 16. But then it gets better. Then in the same manner, another man. Watch this one. Another man, noteworthy for his gray hair and dignity, appeared with astonishing and splendid glory. Ananias, the priest who was dead, tells Judas in the vision, he's talking to Judas, this man is one who loves his brothers and sisters and prays many prayers for the people in the holy city, God's prophet Jeremiah. Bam. Here you go. Onias, a dead priest, appears to Judas Maccabees in a vision. And he's depicted as holding up his hands, praying for the plight of the Jews who are suffering. And then Judas sees another man, an older man, and Onias says to him, This man is one who loves his brothers and sisters and prays many prayers for the people in the holy city, God's prophet Jeremiah. Wow. Even the Jews believed. Even the Jews believed the righteous dead, whether prophets or saints, we're still consciously alive and praying for the people on earth. You getting it or no? Oh, but Maccabees is not scripture. It doesn't have to be. Now, let me read the rest of it. This is an historical book giving us an indication of what the Jews thought and believed at that time before Christ. And yet we don't have a single word in New Testament saying they're wrong or this belief is wrong or an error. And we saw ample evidence that spirit creatures in heaven do pray and intercede for people on earth. Here's the rest of it. 2 Maccabees 12, 12 to 15, but I'm trying. 2 Maccabees 15, chapter 15, 12 to 16. 2 Maccabees 15, verses 12 to 16, but let's read verses 15 to 16 together. I just posted it. Jeremiah extended his strong hand and gave to Judas a gold sword saying, take this holy sword as a gift from God. With it, you'll destroy your enemies. Wow. Folks, are you seeing a pattern here? Old Testament, Jewish sources, New Testament, all teach the dead are alive in some sense. And they are still concerned with the people on earth, God's people, and are praying and mediating our prayers to God. In my view, the Apocrypha are not canonical, but that's my view because I follow the modern Jewish canon. But historically, many Christians, not all Christians, accepted these apocryphal books as sacred scripture, as inspired scripture, and quoted them with authority. Folks, are you tired with the evidence? And by the way, did you guys were you guys aware that this there was this much evidence for this doctrine? How many of you were shocked to find the plethora of biblical 
support verses for this belief that those in heaven are aware and conscious of events on earth. I'm not saying they're aware of everything. And that you do have, in the case of at least angels, intercessory angels who mediate our prayers to God. Joseph, absolutely. They are right. When they're right, they're right. We accept it. We accept what the Bible teaches. How many of you are shocked? Put a one if you're shocked at what you're hearing, because I'm going to do a part three tomorrow, God willing, and we'll talk about other stuff because my time is almost up. Okay. How many of you are upset? Put a one. How many of you are upset? Put a one. Anyone upset? Put a two if you're not. Yep. The Orthodox, the Catholic Church did not make this up. It has biblical precedence and it even predates the time of Jesus Christ. Right? You see the Jews believe in it too? Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do part three tomorrow. Part three tomorrow. I've upset many people today, people who are friends of mine. Perez was one, another guy who came under a nick. I had to block him too. It turned out to be an Assyrian. Because see, once you've made up your mind, then you're going to get upset. Why? If you say you love the Bible, believe the Bible, and if the Bible teaches it, accept it. Tomorrow, Lord willing, I'm going to continue the discussion of communion of saints, and I'm going to make a case that those in heaven are not only aware of what's taking place on earth, but their prayers for us are more powerful, more effective than our prayers on earth are. You ready for part three? We're going to do it tomorrow if you're interested. Do you want me to do a third part? Those who are alive in heaven, now perfected, free of sin. Since they're aware of our plight on earth, can we draw an inference that they are still concerned with us and praying for us and that their prayers are so powerful because they don't have sin hindering their prayers? You want me to do a part three, Lord Jesus willing? Because I'm here to serve you as long as you're not going to stone me and get angry with me and hate me. How many of you guys want part three? Put a yes or put a put a one. Right? Like I told you, I want to be a biblicist. I want to be as close to the Bible as possible and faithful to the Bible as possible. So if there's a doctrine that Protestants reject, but it's clearly in Scripture, I don't care they reject it. If there's a doctrine that Catholics and Orthodox reject, but it's in Scripture, I don't care if they reject it. I don't care. Let me say it again. I don't want to be rude, arrogant. God forgive me. I don't care. I want to know what the Bible teaches by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray the Holy Spirit save me from error, correct my mistakes, and then give me the power to live the Bible, love the Bible, proclaim the Bible because it's the word of God, to be in love with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So if Protestants get upset, why? Catholics get upset, why? Orthodox get upset, why? If it's in the Bible, accept it, man. Right? My time is up. Please do me a favor. Go back, re-listen to this discussion. Pass it on to people. Go back and look at these passages. Study them. And here, pray this prayer for you and me. Beg the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and say, Holy Spirit, if Sam is wrong, Save me from his errors and correct him not to repeat these errors. But if he's right, give me the boldness, give me the courage, and give Sam the boldness and courage to preach the truth, live the truth, love the truth, and die for the truth, even if it may upset various Christian brothers and sisters. And keep praying for me and my daughters that God will protect us, preserve us, fight for us, provide for us. Ask the Lord to keep me holy, in love with him, more like Christ, to get healthier, and to fight this battle that wants to destroy me financially. In Jesus' name, it will not destroy me. He will deliver me from the mouth of the lion for his glory because I belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. Christ is alive. He's almighty, and he loves us. And if you're now convinced the saints in heaven are alive and perfect and aware of things on earth, they too will help us in our fight by praying for us, if you're convinced now. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Please transform us to be in love with you. 
live for you and die for you in Jesus' name. Bless our loved ones, in my case, my daughters, even their mother in Jesus' name. Yes, pray for the ministry. If you want to support me, you can do so on Patreon, even on PayPal, but let me know. Love you guys. Lord willing, part three tomorrow. Part three tomorrow. Keep praying. And by the way, next week, August 28th to September 15th, I'm going to be in the L.A. area. August 28th, Lord Jesus willing, to September 15th, I'm in L.A. So if you're in L.A., you want to see me, <clears throat> right, contact me on Facebook. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys. Now, did you catch this guy here? Did you catch this guy here? Let me let me block this guy. So far, no evidence that we pray to the saints. Here, buddy, because you opened your mouth, you're blocked from my channel. Bye-bye. Hold on, hold on. Let me get rid of this, this guy. Another, another arrogant know-it-all who's not here to learn. Bye-bye. See? I'm glad I caught it before I zoned out. Sorry about that. Take care. Christ is risen.